Thank you, Carl. When I get long introductions like that, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> Trying to live up to it takes a long time. At any rate, tonight we're talking on the subject of Jehovah's Witnesses and Jesus Christ. And we're dealing with how to confront a Jehovah's Witness and how to reach a Jehovah's Witness with the Gospel. A Jehovah's Witness, to give you a little historical background, came into existence primarily through the work of Charles Taze Russell, a haberdasher who lived in Allegheny, Pennsylvania in the 1870s. He started a Bible class in the back of his store in 1870 and founded the Watchtower Organization in 1879. It now publishes in multiple languages, more than 100 all over the world, and the Watchtower produces more literature in a six-month period than the combined presses in the United States of evangelical and denominational works and distributes them door to door. I want to say going in that you cannot fault the Jehovah's Witnesses for their zeal. Their methods are praiseworthy. They're thorough, they're dedicated, they're sincere, they're hardworking, they start more Bible classes in people's homes than all the denominations combined. They make more personal calls on homes and more back calls than the major denominations. And they have a very excellent record before the Supreme Court of the United States of championing American civil rights before it became popular in the 1960s. It's essential to realize that when you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses and with the average Jehovah's Witness on the street corner or wherever you may encounter that person, you are not dealing with some lunatic who is not organized, doesn't have a structured plan, and is ignorant of scripture. Most Jehovah's Witnesses have a good working knowledge of biblical theology based on what the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society interprets for them. They constantly read. They're a print-oriented organization. They're constantly reading. That's why you have difficulty talking to them. They don't hear too well, but they read very well. And you can begin talking to them, and after making some very telling points with the Jehovah's Witness, they just return to the basic idea they had when they started. The reason is, they are not focused in on what you're talking about. Also, when you are confronting a Jehovah's Witness, prayer is the key to everything. You must understand that 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, if our gospel is hid, it's hit to them that are lost, in whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So when you're dealing with a Jehovah's Witness, you're dealing with somebody who denies the Trinity, denies the eternal deity of Jesus Christ, denies the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and who teaches that salvation is on two levels. The first level is for 144,000 who are the bride of Christ. And those 144,000 listed out of context from the book of Revelation are the ones that take communion in Jehovah's Witnesses and the ones that will have the spiritual leadership with Christ in heaven and with Pastor Russell and his successor, Joseph F. Rutherford, Judge Rutherford. Rutherford took over when Russell died and popularized the idea of the kingdom. And he coined the phrase, advertise, 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 the king and the kingdom. It was under Rutherford that their huge presses came into existence, and his adjutant, uh, Nathan Knorr, who succeeded Rutherford when he died in 1942. You're dealing with individuals, therefore, who have run the flag up the pole so that everybody can see it. They do not accept basic Christian theology, and they maintain that their theology was the true theology of the early church, and that it was corrupted by councils and popes and all the rest of Roman Catholicism that they're always whipping publicly and in their publications, and that we Protestants have inherited this. They're almost totally in ignorance of church history, almost totally in ignorance of the church fathers, almost totally in ignorance of systematic biblical theology. They learn from the Watchtower Organization, which is called God's Theocratic Organization. That means that that organization speaks for God on earth and is greater in authority than all other organizations. 
organizations or churches. All churches are, quote, the enemy. Christendom is the enemy. And so Jehovah's Witnesses have developed what I call a siege mentality. And as time goes on, it keeps getting worse and worse. The siege mentality is, it's us, the true kingdom, against them, who are the world and the churches who have been corrupted by Satan. The devil's organization, they brand all government authority and all church authority. So when you're dealing with the Jehovah's Witness, remember, you're dealing with a thoroughly conditioned mind. You're dealing with people who are told that they are not to over-fraternize with people, that their children must be carefully trained at home, they will not salute the flag of any nation, they set themselves apart by specific things. And that's what creates the siege mentality. We are the last ones. We are with our backs up against the wall. We're doing the job. And they almost welcome persecution. One of the things that comes with Jehovah's Witnesses is that when you try and lead the organization, it can be very, very difficult. Because if all your friends are Jehovah's Witnesses, and if your life has been built around the Watchtower and its organization, then you lose everything. Your relatives are permitted to talk to you, but only about non-spiritual things, unless they're trying to convert you. If your relative, your wife, or your child, or anybody that's in your family, tries to get you out of the Watchtower, automatically you can't talk about this thing with them. You must understand that for a Jehovah's Witness to lead the Watchtower organization is to bring all channels of communication. They are treated much as the Orthodox Jews treat those who become evangelical Christians or Christians. That is, they have a type of spiritual funeral in which the person is no longer considered alive. So when you disfellowship Jehovah's Witnesses, you are a dead person to all intents and purposes. And the effect upon children, the effect upon families is paralyzing. Studies have been done in Canada, in Europe, in the United States, showing a tremendous emotional breakdown psychologically within the structure of the organization because of the rigid control. Now, another thing you must recognize about Jehovah's Witnesses is that it doesn't do any good to attack the Watchtower. If you attack the Watchtower organization, they automatically turn off. The computer that Jehovah's Witnesses have in their head, which we call the brain, has been programmed by the Watchtower Society to certain specific things. Certain things will turn the computer on, and certain things will turn the computer off. If you attack the Watchtower, criticize Russell or Rutherford, the computer shuts down. For instance, if you were to say to a Jehovah's Witness in discussion, the Watchtower organization is wrong when it says this. Switch it's wrong. Click. And you go right on talking, nothing is heard. Finally, when you're finished, then right back to where they were before. Everyone that's ever dealt with Jehovah's Witnesses has the same frustrating experience. You begin to talk to them, they talk to you, they seem perfectly normal and friendly, and then you get to a point of theological disagreement. For instance, the Trinity or the deity of our Lord. And then, all of a sudden, there is a pardoning. Watch how our people give you a series of set verses. You answer the verses. Then, when they can't answer you, or if they can, then they switch right over to another subject. It's almost like uh, an eight-track tape. And all the tracks on the tape have been programmed. And they are giving you the material they have learned by reading Watchtower material and listening to Watchtower lectures. As soon as you get to one of those tracks and you contradict it, and refute it, then the machine automatically triggers and they kick over to the next track. So if you're talking on the Trinity and they can't answer a question, they kick over to the deity of Christ. If you're talking the deity of Christ, they kick over to the resurrection. If you're talking the resurrection, they kick over to the 144,000. So the elite class of the 144,000, a friend of mine, a member of the Watchtower for many years, was one of their best workers in the United States in their Brooklyn headquarters. And he got saved, remarkably converted to Christ. And then he witnessed to his former Jehovah's Witness friends. Of course, they wouldn't talk to him because he was his fellowship. And he kept on witnessing everybody that he could. Finally, he 
figured I can't get them to talk to me, maybe they'll read something. So I wrote a tract, 143,999. And then he passed the tract all over the lunch tower and said, they're reading the tract, but they wouldn't talk to him. And he got a chance to witness that way. The second level of salvation are the great multitude of individuals uh, who are not, who are into all those witnesses, but are not of the 144,000. And these people are going to live forever in happiness on earth. So if you say to a Jehovah's Witness, don't you want to go to heaven and be with Jesus? Nine times out of ten? No. They want to live forever in happiness on earth. Only the 144,000, Pastor Russell, Judge Rutherford, Mr. Moore, are going to be living with Jesus. So you'll strike out in that area immediately. Another thing that you have to watch out for in dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses is the Watchtower has taught them that there are people unworthy to hear certain spiritual truths. And I have in my hand here uh, a photocopy of the Watchtower's book, Aid to Bible Understanding, published by the Watchtower Bible Tract Society. In here you will see how the Jehovah's Witness is permitted to lie to you under certain circumstances. Now most people say, that couldn't be one of their teachings. Oh yes, it is. Listen to it. Lie. The opposite of truth. Lying is generally involved in saying something false to a person who is entitled to know the truth and doing so with the intent to deceive or to injure him or another person. A lie can you know, always be verbal, can also be expressed in action. That is, a person may be living a lie. So, definition, something false to a person who is entitled to know the truth. When you turn your page over, you get the continuation. While malicious lying is definitely condemned in the Bible, this does not mean that a person is under obligation to divulge truthful information to people who are not entitled to it. Did you hear that? Not under obligation to divulge truthful information to people not entitled to it. Who are the people not entitled? Ministers, priests, Christians who are in effect countering Jehovah's Witnesses' teachings. And so they will blithely look at you and say, I don't believe this. And yet, you can quote right out of the Jehovah's Witness book and say, that's what it says here. Then they'll say, oh yes, well yes, that depends on how you're looking at this. Well, does it say that? Yes. Now you have uncovered a lie. And you say to the person, why don't you tell me the truth? Why don't you tell me what you believe? And they say, well, we, we, we don't want to discuss that. Why? Well, because in the major text on the subject, that's what you're supposed to do. Now the danger of dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, and there is a real danger, is that if you don't know why you believe what you believe, it's very difficult for you to resist what is very carefully thought out historical error. The reason why the Jehovah's Witnesses are so successful is that the real brains behind Jehovah's Witnesses' basic view of the Trinity and Jesus Christ is actually a fourth century theologian named Arius of Alexandria. It was Arius' theology that entered the Christian church in the fourth century and that almost destroyed Christendom by denying the Trinity and the eternal deity of Jesus Christ. The church called the Council dealt with this, the Council of Chalcedon and then also the Council of Nicaea, and they pronounced that this was heretical and expelled the people that believed it. It went underground and disappeared from church history until Russell brought it to life again. But Russell didn't get it by himself. He got it from Dr. John Thomas, the founder of the Christadelphians. So the Christadelphian cult gave birth to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, and the Watchtower Society today, three million people worldwide, including the people that are considered friendly towards them, are a very powerful, well-organized group. Do not try and deal with them unless you understand why you believe what you believe. In other words, it is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and dispel all doubt. 
A lot of Christians get into trouble with Jehovah's Witnesses because they get burned in their conversation and Jehovah's Witness gives them something they can't answer. From that moment on, they shy off from Jehovah's Witnesses. Instead, they should get more of their faith and more of their basic theology down than they can witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses. You do not have to be afraid of them if you understand some basic principles. So I want to give you some of these basic principles and then I'm going to give you a technique for witnessing to the Jehovah's Witness that knocks at your front door. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the end of the world is imminent. They have been teaching it since 1889. In 1889, they said, the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which will end in A.D. 1914, with the complete overthrow of Earth's present rulership, is already commenced. That was 1889. They said today, 1914. And this wouldn't really make any difference if it was just an opinion or a theological speculation. But the Watchtower organization taught, and still does, they are God's prophet. They speak for Jehovah. So when these things come out, this isn't just an opinion, as one of them said to me. Well, you know, the, the light gets brighter as you move toward the more perfect day. And I said to them, look, if you make a mistake in prophecy, that's one thing. If I make a mistake in prophecy, that's another thing. But if God makes a mistake in prophecy, we are in an egg full young we are never going to get out of. And they'll laugh just as you did and say, well, God doesn't make mistakes. I said, no, he doesn't. But the Watchtower organization claims to speak for God and they have made mistakes. Now, the only way you can say that to them is if you have some handy little facts in your hands. I had a Jones witness knock on my door in California a few years ago. And it was a Saturday morning when I was trying to relax, and they always know you're home on Saturdays or in the morning. And this knock came on the door, and I opened it, and there's a man standing there with this adorable little boy. He says, good morning, sir. How are you today? I said, fine. How are you? He said, uh, we're doing uh, some canvassing in the neighborhood, and uh, I've got an article here I think you'd like to read. I said, what does it say? He said, the article says, whom can you trust? I said, that's a great title. Who can you trust? He says, you can trust Jehovah God. I said, amen. And you can trust Jesus Christ. And he said, amen. And I said, you can trust the Bible. It's God's word. He said, amen. And I said, you can trust that God is going to judge the world in righteousness. Because he says so. Amen. And he said, are you a Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm a Christian. Place what the Bible says. Oh, that's interesting. So, well, this article will really interest you. Now, this is technique number one. I said to him, What kind of business are you in? Switch off the theological track. What kind of business are you in? Oh, well, I, I work at uh, San Clemente and I'm in sales and so forth. I said, Okay. I said, Tell me. I said, Supposing somebody promised to deliver some products to your business at a specific date that was essential for you to get your business done. He said, right, happened all the time. I said, good. I said, and then the date came and the product didn't. And then the salesman called up on the phone and said, uh, we had a little miscalculation on the time and uh, wonder if we could deliver it next week. He said, well, anybody can make a mistake. Everybody has problems. Okay, next week. Next week comes, and he does it. And then he does this to you seven times. What do you think of the product? What do you think of the man? He said, well, he wouldn't get a chance to do it to me past the second time. He said, what do you take me for, a fool? He said, anybody that lied to me seven times? He said, I'd never believe in anything. I said, any man, I agree with you. I said, I've got a little document here I'd like you to look at. It may be very helpful for you. And he said, what is it? I said, it's quotations from the Watchtower Organization. He read 1889. I said, tell me, did Earth's present rulership end in 1914? He said, no. 
I said, 1897, our Lord, the appointed king, is now present since October 1874. The Bible chronology here proves that the great thousand-year days beginning with Adam are ended. The great seventh day, the thousand-year reign of Christ began in 1873. I said, the millennium began in 1873. I said, in the millennium, the lion lies down with the lamb, right? He said, right. I said, the only way they lie down now is if the lamb is inside the lion. <laughs> Something's wrong about 1873. 1918. We might confidently expect that 1925 will mark the return of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Didn't happen in 1914. It didn't happen in 1960. It didn't happen in 1918. Now it's 1925. 1923. Our thought is that the 1925 date is definitely settled by Scripture. I said, we got that? Scripture said that. 1925. Now 1925. The year 1925 is here. The great expectation Christians have looked forward to this year. Many have confidently expected that all members of the body of Christ will be changed to heaven and glory. This may be accomplished. It may not. I said, wait a minute. It was absolutely fixed by the scriptures. And now it's going to happen. 1931. There was a measure of disappointment on the part of Jehovah's faithful ones on earth concerning the years 1914, 1918, and 1925. Which disappointment lasted for a time. They also learned to quit fixing dates. That's the one stop. We quit fixing dates. 1931. 1941. Receiving the gift, the marching children clasped it to them. The Lord's provided instrument for the most effective work in the remaining months before Armageddon. And he's reading this. I'm not. If I read it, he may not listen. But he got this, and he's reading this. He's got to see it. That's the way he's been taught to think. He reads, he absorbs print. He's print-oriented. And he's watching. And you can see the lights going on in his head. And it's really bothering him. Then we get to 1968. This is really upsetting. This came from the White House, the Wake Magazine. Quote, True there have been those in times past who predicted an end to the world, even announcing a specific date, yet nothing happened. The end did not come. They were guilty of false prophesying. Why, what was missing? Missing from such people were God's truth and the evidence that he was guiding and using them. Close quote. I said, look at that. The Watchtower calls itself a false prophet in 1968. He said, where'd you get that? I said, from the Watchtower Society. Said, they sent you that? I said, I photocopied the pages. Would you like to see the pages? No. I said, well, it gets even worse. Because it goes on to predict 1975 when you lost 10% of your people. Because it didn't happen in 1975 either. I said, you become Armageddon Incorporated. 1889, 1914, 1918, 1925, 1941, and 1975. Doesn't happen. And he said, well, you know, the light does get brighter as you go toward that perfect day. I said, not when God says it. And I said, read the Watchtower, April 1st, 1972. And it's not April Fool. Does Jehovah have a prophet to help them, to warn them of dangers and declare things to come? These questions can be answered in the affirmative. This prophet was not one man, but a body of men and women. The small group of footstep followers of Jesus Christ, known at that time as international Bible students, today they are known as Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. Of course, it's easy to say this group acts as a prophet. It's another thing to prove it. The only way that you can do this is review the record. What does it show? This tract, which we give you, you can print as many as you want, is called 100 Years of Divine Direction. And it carefully lists for you all the false prophecies. So I let him be exposed to this. He said, uh, well, he said, uh, I, I don't have any real answer for this right now. And I said, well, I think there is a real answer for it. I said, it also comes from the Watchtower organization's own magazine, The Watchtower. The magazine says, a 
A false prophet is a person who claims to be representing Jehovah and to speak in his name and to proclaim his message, but in fact is the mouthpiece of Satan. And they said, there it is in the watchtower itself. Whoever speaks and it doesn't happen is a mouthpiece of Satan. His eyes are glued to it. It matters not whether he proclaims his message with deliberate, willful, and malicious intent to deceive, or whether he is the blinded and deluded dupe of Satan, hence unwittingly used by him. In either case, he is a false prophet and the agent of Satan. Close quote. Dead silence. All the tracks on the cassette stopped. He was thinking. Now, you must use this approach with discretion. You must not, after you presented the evidence and the tract, pound them on the head with it. Instead, lovingly say to them, you should pray about this information. You should check it out in your Watchtower publications Check it out in your Bible and find out whether it's true. If it's true, you really shouldn't be working for a false prophet. You told me yourself, anybody that lied to you seven times wouldn't ever be trusted again. Here's the evidence. Look at the evidence. Pray about it. Speak to them in love, not in combat. The chances are they'll take the track not telling anybody in the Kingdom Hall and read it. Praise Jehovah's Witnesses where they are praiseworthy. We can learn a lot of lessons from them. We can learn how they witness. We can learn their tenacity. We can learn the way that they're out there all the time calling on homes, keeping a record of what they do. We can learn a lot. If Christians would go out as vigorously proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ as the Jehovah's Witnesses do the Watchtower gospel, you could convert a large segment of the world in a very short period of time. At least you could cover the whole world because they're doing a magnificent job with the wrong gospel. Think of how wonderful it would be if we could do the job with the right gospel. Very important. Now, when you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, be very careful to define your terms because they have a vocabulary very similar to ours. So if you say to a Jehovah's Witness, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The Jehovah's Witness will say, absolutely. Christ Jesus conquered death. He rose from the dead the third day. The average Christian is quite likely to let that slide by. But to us, resurrection is biblical and means one thing. To them, resurrection has been redefined. So they can use the same word and mean something completely different. Let me read to you what the Jehovah's Witnesses really believe about the resurrection of Christ. He was put to death in the flesh and resurrected an invisible spirit creature. The man, Jesus, is dead. Forever dead. How did Jesus prove his resurrection? By manufacturing bodies that looked like his resurrection body. So when they saw him, they thought it was the same body, but actually, it wasn't. Now, if you're going to deal with Jehovah's Witnesses, remember that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of Christianity. You can take all biblical doctrine tie it up with a pink bow and drop it in the ash can. If Jesus Christ did not come out of the tomb the third day in fulfillment of biblical prophecy, he would be a false prophet, a liar, and he could not be the Messiah. A passage of scripture I frequently use with Jehovah's Witnesses, which is devastating in its effect when you're witnessing it, is in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. I'd like you to open your Bibles to John, chapter 2. I'd like you to remember the words of the Lord Jesus as we're reading it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You do not believe me, for the words that I speak to you, 
Believe me for the works which I perform because they testify of me. He tied his ministry and his words to his works. His greatest prophecy is found in John 2. He has just cleansed the temple of Jerusalem. And the Jews are very upset with him. Jesus is confronted by an angry group of Jews who say to him, John chapter 2, beginning at verse 18, By what authority? In other words, where do you get the right to speak, seeing that you are doing these things? What sign can you show us? How can you prove to us that you have the right to cleanse the temple? Who do you think you are? They're mad. Now this appears only once in the entire New Testament. Once. It describes in detail the nature of the resurrection and it is a prophecy. If he doesn't fulfill it, he's a liar. And nobody's going to believe it. If he does fulfill it, Christianity is true. And the gospel is to be believed at the peril of your soul. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, 46 years it took to build this temple. You will build it in three days. See the confusion? They thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem that he just cleansed. Verse 21. Now the Jehovah's Witnesses read this for you. But he was speaking of the temple of his, what does it say? Louder. Body. I'm going to make you an instant Greek scholar. Ready? Circle the word body. Draw a line to the margin. And print. S-O-M-A. Slama. That is the Greek word for body. It never means soul. It never means mind. It never means spirit. It always means body. Jesus uttered a fantastic prophecy. He said, you kill this body, and in three days I will raise it up again. Verse 21, he spoke of the temple of his body. Look at verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. They believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. This is good Catholic theology. This is good Protestant theology. It is sound biblical theology. Catholics and Protestants can use it in witnessing the Jehovah's Witnesses effectively because they have no response to it. Two Jehovah's Witnesses on my doorstep were asking me questions one morning, and I thought, I don't have the time really to spend two hours going through all this. I'm mortal like everybody else. I better use something quickly and see what effect it has. I ended up an hour and a half anyhow. But it was very rewarding. And I said to the Jehovah's Witness boys that were standing there, don't you believe that when Jesus rose from the dead, he came back as a ghost or as a spirit? Now, what am I doing? I am referring them to their own teaching. They can't back off that. That came from the Watchtower, God's organization. Quote their own theology. Question them. Do not try and preach to them. If you try and preach to them or teach them anything, the computer turns off because only the Watchtower can teach. So you never want to appear to teach them something or preach to them. Instead, use Christ's method. Interrogate them. Question them. Push them to give you answers to questions for which there are no answers. And as soon as they run out of gas, then you will end up teaching them and preaching to them without them even knowing that it's happened. What have you done? You have bypassed the computer. Now there are certain key words that turn Jehovah's Witnesses on. You want to write these down. They're very valuable. Key word number one. 
I have a problem. Problem. Two. I wonder if you could help me. I don't understand. I wonder if you could show me. They are salivating on your doorstep like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> help, 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 help. They've been programmed for this. They've been programmed to believe the ultimate arrogance. Do you know what it is? Only they have the truth. Only the watchtower has the truth. So they're the ones that can give you the truth. Let them. Because as soon as they start, you can ask questions they can't answer. Then you can end up doing the witnessing. You'll bypass the computer. So this young Jehovah's Witness said to me, well, if we can help you, we certainly will. I said, that I, I've got a problem here that really disturbs me. I'm disturbed. See, the whole organization is problem-solving oriented. You have the problem, they're going to solve it. So you can't fight that kind of programming because it'll just turn off. So let them help you solve it. I began that way. Don't you believe that Jesus came back from the dead as a spirit? I read in 1 Corinthians 15 that the Apostle Paul said the resurrection is very important. He says if Christ is not risen from the dead, your faith is empty and you're still in your sins. Is that true? Yes, that's true. The Apostle Paul was right. And you do believe that. Yes, Jesus came back from the dead as a spiritual being. He didn't have a physical body. No, now we'd like to show you, and that's the point you stop. And you say, well, I'm not arguing this with you. I'm not fighting with you about this. I just wanted to know, is that what you believe? They'll say, yes. You say, and that's what bothers me. I found something in the Bible that seems to contradict that. Jehovah's Witness boy said, the Bible does not contradict itself. It is the word of God. I said, amen. I believe that. And he said, but this sure does appear to be contradictory to what you said. Where is it? They couldn't wait to get there. So I said, well, I don't have my Bible here. I said, let's use yours. Turn to John chapter 2. And they did. I said, why don't you read it for me? I don't have my glasses. <laughs> Now here's how he read this. The Jews said, What sign showest thou of seeing as you do these things? And Jesus said, Break down this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple of building. You've got to build it in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. That was it. Absolutely, totally blind. Didn't see a thing. And it was true. Didn't see a thing. Could take a lie detector test, couldn't it? Couldn't come to the truth, couldn't see it. I'm praying this whole time, this prayer, you should memorize this prayer, it's very simple. Lord Jesus, open the eyes and ears of their souls and minds so they can see you and hear you. Because you can't see if you're blind and you can't hear if you're deaf. And the unsaved are in the category of the blind. 2 Corinthians 4.4. They're disabled, walking wounded because of sin. Well, I said, maybe I missed it. So you don't want to jump in and start teaching. Maybe I missed it. Why don't you read it and see what it says again? So the other one read it. So I got two readings out of it. And he got to the last verse. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. He said, I honestly don't know what you're referring to. I said, well, Tell you what, let's read it together three times through. Let's read it together. So we read it together. And I said, destroy this temple or break down this temple as your Bible has it. I said, tell me, what temple was that? You see the methodology? It's interrogation. Jesus used it all the time. You can't improve on Christ. Ask the right questions. Ask the right questions. 
said, what temple is Jesus talking about? One on my left said, oh, that's easy. He said, that's the temple of Jerusalem. He just cleansed that temple. I said, oh, that's very clear. That makes it perfectly clear. Destroy this temple of Jerusalem. In three days, I will raise it up. I said, but something's wrong with verse 21 then. He was speaking of the temple of Jerusalem. And the one on my right said, it doesn't say that. I said, well, what does it say? He said, it says he was speaking of the temple of his body. The light went on. That's the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should attain repentance. Amen? You believe that? The grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all mankind. You believe that? Of course God wants to save it. Well then, God's promise applies to you and me. This is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything in accordance with His will, He hears us. And if He hears us, we know we have the petition we have required from Him. He's heard us. He wants to save them. He wants them to find the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. We're not talking about churches and denominations. We're talking about finding the Lord Jesus. That's the most important thing. Well, one of them looked at me for a second and said, and you won't believe this, totally off the subject, off the wall, he said, what's Jesus doing in heaven with his own body anyhow? He saw it. So I gave him a typical answer for Jehovah's Witness. Off the wall. I said, what business is that of yours, what he does with his body in heaven? It's not your body. <laughs> and he didn't know what to say. Oh, I said, if Jehovah God wants to take his son's body to heaven, you're going to tell him he can't? The other one says, of course you can't tell Jehovah God not to do something. I said, amen. Jehovah God makes all the decisions, right? Right. I got that settled. You can't tell Jehovah anything. I said, well, then, maybe something's here that we haven't seen before. I said, Jesus made a prophecy. He said, destroy this body. And in three days, I will raise it up again. I said, look closely there. It says, this body. And then John says, his body. By this time, the computer is totally confused. All the tracks have merged together. And what you, you can almost hear going on inside their heads. Error, 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 doesn't compute, doesn't compute, doesn't compute, error, 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 but they have no answer. Central control is gone, the computer is broken down, they're on their own. And that's where you have the opportunity. Switch gears, as quickly as possible. Don't flog the text to death. Just go to the next text, 22. And I'm reading this. When therefore Jesus is risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. I said, what was the word that Jesus had said? The one on my left says, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. I said, he must have done that. Otherwise, Jesus lied. I said, you don't believe Jesus could lie, do you? Absolutely not. Jesus always told the truth. I said, well, that sure settles it then. He said, I'm going to bring my body back to the grave. If he did it, he was telling the truth. If he didn't, he was a liar. They just blinked. Dead silence. Now, switch gears. Go into hyperspeed. I said to him, you know, this verse has always troubled me. But there's another one that upsets me. They're so glad to get out of John chapter 2, they will run any place. <laughs> so you keep your finger in John 2 and you flip over to Luke 24 and you have them read that. The one on my left read Luke 24 to me. Jesus appears to his disciples after the resurrection. Verse 36. And as they were thus speaking, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. I said, look at verse 37. Read it. They were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. I said, isn't that what you believe? They said, yes. I said, look at that. The disciples and the apostles made the same mistake that you do. 
One of them said, the apostles didn't make mistakes. I said, they sure did. Oh, no, they didn't. Oh, yes, they did. Oh, no, they didn't. We shouted at each other for a moment or so. That's just to get the adrenaline flowing. <laughs> and then I said, well, all right. Let's not fight about it. What did Jesus say to them when they thought he was a spirit? Why are you troubled? Verse 38. Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. He said, hey, Jesus says he's got flesh and bone. One of them said, I can answer this one. I said, go ahead. He said, remember how the angels of the Old Testament and the New Testament took on a human form to convince people that they were real? I said, oh yeah, I remember that. Book of, book of Genesis. Jacob wrestled with the angel and so forth. I said, sure, I remember all that. And they said, well, that's what Jesus did. Jesus manufactured or created a body that looked exactly like the body that was on the torture stick. They never say cross, it's torture stick. And I said, uh, that solves it perfectly. I said, that really puts it in its proper perspective. And they smiled. I said, Jesus is a liar. <laughs> Jesus is not a liar. Jesus always told the truth. I said, it's got to be a liar. He just broke He told the truth. I said, you had to lie. Where did you get that from? I said, remember John 2? Destroy this body, and in three days I will raise this body up. And after he rose from the dead, they remembered the prophecy and believed in him. I said, look at this. It is I myself handle me and see. But it wasn't Jesus' body. It was a phony body that he manufactured to convince them. So he's both a liar and a deceiver. <coughs> Dead silence. Jesus didn't lie. I said, I agree with you. Jesus always told the truth. And he came back in the same body that hung on that torture stick. Well, they didn't like the fact that I wore a cross. Lots of people don't. And they want to know why a Southern Baptist theologian is wearing a big cross, which in a lot of Protestants' minds tends to indicate that one is a Roman Catholic. Nothing could be further from the truth. The earliest symbol of Christianity was not the cross, it was a fish. The acronym of the fish was Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior in the Greek alphabet, Ichthus. That's why the Christians used the fish to bypass the Romans and the Jews so they wouldn't get persecuted. To identify each other, they showed a fish, confessing who Jesus was. The second oldest symbol is the cross, not the torture stake. Jesus didn't die on a torture stake. If so, then the earliest symbol would have been a stake. He died on the cross, and the second earliest symbol is the cross. The cross is a marvelous Christian symbol. The empty cross means he is not here. He died for our sins. He's risen. But I found something else out. I've conducted a number of exorcisms with people who were demonically possessed. I found out that demons do not like crosses. They hate them and they fear them. Whatever demons hate and fear, I want as close to me and as big as I can get. <laughs> so if a Roman Catholic wants to wear a cross, don't come down on his back because he's got a cross or a crucifix. Because what he's saying is, he believes that Jesus died on the cross for his sins. I take an empty cross instead of a crucifix because I like to emphasize the fact that he's risen. But the fact still remains the cross is a potent symbol of the power of God. Nothing wrong with wearing one. Just as the dove is the symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
descended upon the church of Pentecost. So, you must bring them to the place where they are constantly getting their questions answered, and you are pressing them with questions they can't answer. Repeat constantly the same phrases using different words. Get yourself a dictionary of synonyms and learn how to say the same thing at least three different ways so that while you are talking to them and reading scripture with them, you can plant the seed at least three times. That's important. Repetition is important, but not the same words. Always exalt the Lord Jesus. Always exalt the scriptures as the authority. Always appeal to the history of the Christian church. You arrived in 1879. We have been here since the first century. It is highly unlikely that you would have discovered something in 1879 that we did not know about in the first century. Don't get into theological arguments with them about the immortality of the soul, the nature of hell, eternal punishment, the 144,000. These are peripheral issues. Stay with the center. The center is Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh. The center is the resurrection of the Savior. And if He's not risen from the dead, your faith is empty, you're still in your sins. Write down this important fact that helps you with Jehovah's Witnesses. In the Greek, the word resurrection refers exclusively to the body, never to the spirit, never to the soul, always to the body. This is true in the Old Testament and true in the New Testament, in Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. So when you redefine the term resurrection to refer to a spirit, you are changing the dictionary and the lexicon's definition of it. They have no ground to stand on whatsoever. You get to that point by saying to them, have you ever checked the Greek lexicon on the word resurrection? And they don't even know what a lexicon is most of the time. And they'll say, well, no. You say, well, I took the trouble to check this out. And the word means body. It talks about the body. There's nothing about the spirit there. Oh. Well, then you change the meaning of the word. Now, all this time, you never attack the watchdog. All this time, you have questioned them to a place where they have no answer. All this time, you're constantly praying and planting the seed of the word of God. I want to tell you how powerful that word is. Scripture says the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than the two-edged sword. It penetrates. You can. All the logic, all the philosophy, all the exegesis, all of the arguments that you can come up with against Jehovah's Witnesses will avail you nothing apart from God, the Holy Spirit. It is He <clears throat> who has to touch the mind and the soul. And He promises to do that if you are faithful. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is love. You must be loving when you talk to them. Truly love them for Christ's sake. Remember what you were in your mind before Christ opened your eyes. Can you remember? I can. Now that's where they are. In darkness. And they're looking for light. They have a little bit of light. But they don't have the light of the gospel. You've got to pray for them. You've got to love them. You've got to manifest one of the important fruits of the Spirit, patience. I know it's hard. You talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they start denying biblical doctrines, your blood pressure rises to 5,000, you place them under a divine curse and ship them off your front porch to hell. Being careful, of course, to give them your testimony first so your conscience is clear. That is not the way witness. The church has been trying to witness the Jehovah's Witnesses for a hundred years this way and it hasn't worked. The church has attacked the Watchtower for a hundred years, and that hasn't worked. I'm telling you what I'm teaching you tonight works. 
and you get the chance to plant the seed. Now I've got wonderful news for you. The salvation of that Jehovah's Witness does not depend upon you, your brilliance, or your arguments. It depends upon the fact that the Holy Spirit has said from the Lord Jesus, when the Spirit of Truth comes, He will convince the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Do you believe that? That's the ministry of the Spirit, isn't it? Look at the burden I just took off your back. You don't have to convince them. All you have to do is plant the seed, witness to them, love them for Christ's sake, and pray for them. God's job is to apply it to their hearts. God's job is to bring them repentance. God brings repentance, not human arguments. And God will do it because he's promised to bring them to life if they'll just look in his direction. The power of the word is positively incalculable. I'm going to close because time has rushed by us at an enormous rate of speed. There are many passages you can use that are contained in my book on Jehovah's Witnesses and on pamphlets and tracts and cassettes. All the information and work is there for you. So I'm not going to go into all that because it would be two or three hours just covering the basics. But I want to tell you something about the power of the word that you can rely on. A few years ago I was speaking in the church in the States on a cold night. Now you see outside tonight is cold for a Californian because my arteries twitch when I come out the door of the hotel. You people walk around in jackets and coats and you say, what's the matter with these crazy Americans? Our blood is thinned out. Come visit us in California for about a month and a half and come back here and you'll twitch too. <laughs> but it was a very cold night. I know because it's a bit snowing. The temperature was down in the 20s for us in the east where I live, that was cold, nothing to you. And I came to this church and lectured on Jehovah's Witnesses. The last two and a half rows were filled with the Kingdom Hall. They came over to hear me so they could question the afterwards in the question period. I lectured. When I finished, the Jehovah's Witness lady got up. And she pounded away on me for 35 minutes, one person. She had a list of questions that wouldn't quit. And I'd answer the question, she'd sit down, she'd bounce up again, down, up, down, up. She was a very well-informed Jehovah's Witness. I answered her questions. The meeting ended. I had to catch a train, it was cold. So I took off out the front door. When I walked through the front door of the church, the Jehovah's Witnesses were all standing outside in the cold, stamping their feet with their Bibles open. They weren't gonna quit. They wanted some more answers. I stood out there until my feet were numb answering their questions. While I'm answering questions, this lady is pushing me. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. Ask her one. And I said, good thinking. I wish I had thought of that. I got myself out of all this problem. And I looked at her and I said, you know, you asked me a lot of questions tonight. She said, yes, I have. I said, obviously, you're a well-informed Jehovah's Witness. She'd been a Jehovah's Witness for 11 and a half years, and she was one of the most zealous workers. The others looked up to her. I said, okay, I believe you're sincere. I believe you're an honest person. Someone asked you a question, I expect an honest answer. She said, you'll get one. I said, good. Supposing Jesus Christ told you he was coming back from the dead in his own body, would you believe that? Mm -hmm. She said, Jesus never said that. I said, I never said he did. I just said, if he told you, would you believe him? She said, anything Jesus told me, I would believe. I said, good. Would you read this passage for me in John chapter 2? She read it. And she went tearing right through it, just the way the other Jehovah's Witness had. Because she got to this one. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And she stopped. I'm praying this whole time, Lord, open, open, open. And this lady's really sincere. Open her eyes. And she says, but he was speaking of the temple of his ever so quiet. I said, I didn't hear you, dear. What did you say? She said, body. 
I said, I still can't hear you, dear. She said, body! B-O-D-Y, body! I don't know what possessed me to do this, except it had to be the Spirit of God. And I doubled up my fist, and I took my Bible, which was closed, and I held it right under her nose, and I said, Jesus said he was coming back from the dead in his own body, 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 body. And as I kept repeating that word, it was as if a hammer was hitting that whole congregation or flinching like this every time I used the word body, body, body. And I said, if he came back from the dead in his own body, he is God in human flesh. If he's God in human flesh, the Trinity is true. If the Trinity is true, you're lost. And if you're lost, you're going to hell. All the chimes went off. They just, uh, dead silence. And one of them asked me another question. One of them tried another question. All of a sudden, this lady piped up. She said, wait a minute. I don't agree with him. You know where I stand. But I never did see that till tonight. He did say he was going to raise his own body. Daylight. The lights on. Boy, did I pray for that lady that night. I left. I was half frozen. I got a letter from the pastor of the church and a telephone call. Hey, Walter, I know you need all the encouragement in your ministry that you can get. I got some for you. I said, what is this? You remember that Jehovah's Witness lady three or four weeks ago? I said, yeah. He said, you'll never believe this. He said, she showed up in my office this week. And he said, she looked like she hadn't slept in weeks. She had big circles under her eyes. Her hair was unkempt. She looked awful. And her eyes were all red and crying. And she sat down. I said, sit down. What, what seems to be the trouble? How can I help you? She said, Pastor Jackson, you remember that man Martin who was here? He said, yes, I, I remember Walter was here at the church. She said, you don't know what happened to us afterwards. I said, no. He said, I don't know what, what, what did Walter do. She said, we met him outside. He answered some questions. And then she said, he had me read a passage from John chapter 2. And he took his fist on his Bible. And she said, he slammed it under my nose as hard as he could. And he kept saying, body, body, body. She said, I've been laying in bed for two and a half weeks and all I hear all night long is body, 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 body. And she started to cry. And she looked at me and she said, I know that Jesus came out of the grave in his own body. And she said, tell me, what do I do to be saved? And he said, she got down her knees in my study and gave her heart to Jesus Christ. One word of scripture. You hear that? One word. You can't get excited about that. You are God's frozen baby. <laughs> that won't excite anybody. One word. That lady, the story doesn't end here. That lady really had courage. She had all the records of the people she called on for 11 years. She was baptized in the First Baptist Church of New Hyde Park, Long Island. Became a member of that church and taught classes to the people there on how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. The first Sunday after she had been born again, she went to the Kingdom Hall and stood up, and they thought she was a Jehovah's Witness and they didn't stop her, and she preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and told them they had to be born again, the one power was wrong, they had been deceived, Jesus came back from the dead in his own body, and you had to believe in him to be saved. She led seven Jehovah's Witnesses from her congregation to Christ that day, out of the watchtower. One moment, the power of one word doesn't end there. She gathered 11 years of literature, piled it up in the backyard, poured kerosene over it, and invited all the witnesses from the kingdom all over for a barbecue and burned it. <laughs> Got a great sense of humor, too. <laughs> Doesn't end there. She went back with 11 and a half years of records to all the places she'd been to and knocked on their door again. People would open it, she'd say, so-and-so, yes. Well, I'm your friendly ex-Jehovah's Witness, remember me? 
Remember all that stuff I told you about the watchtower, the 144,000? Don't believe any of that stuff. You've got to get more to get it. <laughs> She'd get everybody, but she could get her hands on it. The final icing on the cake was when two Mormon missionaries called on her. Knocked on the door and said, we're representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ on a day saying. She said, you're Mormon missionaries. They said, yes. She says, come on in. I used to be a cultist too. <laughs> they didn't know what to say. She got in the living room. She opened up her Bible. She said, now, you just got to listen to me for a minute. I want to tell you what this is all about. And she zapped it to him, who Jesus was. See, the Mormons believe Jesus rose from the dead bodily. She didn't have to teach that. She had to teach who he was. Teach a Mormon who he is, you've got to teach him right out of the scripture and have him read it. The word was God. Those two Mormon missionaries were down on their knees in the next Jehovah's Witnesses living room, asking for the Holy Spirit to open their eyes and their ears and their souls so they could understand what she was talking about. I don't know whether they ever got saved or not. I'll tell you one thing. They sure got the gospel. The power of one word, the temple of his life. Never underestimate scripture. It's a hammer. It'll smash whatever gets in its way. It's a sword. It penetrates to the depths of the human soul like nothing else can do. And it judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Love Jehovah's Witnesses for Jesus' sake. He died for their sins as he died for ours. Have patience with them. Remember when you were before you knew Christ. Reach out to them. God saves Jehovah's Witnesses. And right now in this audience tonight, I wager, though I'm not a betting man, there are people who are in Jehovah's Witnesses and today are in the kingdom of heaven. Are there any ex-Jehovah's Witnesses here? One. Anybody else? Two. Anybody else? Front. Three. Front. Any more? Four. Any more? Five. God saves Jehovah's Witnesses. Amen? But he saves them if you love them, if you take the time and the trouble, if you give them the gospel. Don't slam the door in their face. Don't run away from confrontation. Do what the gospel says to do. Preach the word to them. Convenient or inconvenient. Love them. Pray for patience. Plant the seeds. Water them with prayer. God will give the increase. The Jehovah's Witnesses today have 489,000 full and part-time missionaries. Do you realize that? The combined missionary force of the Christian church is less than 110,000. And the Watchtower has 489,000. Do you realize that the Jehovah's Witnesses are doing our job better than we are doing it? We should be training Protestants and Catholics in their Bibles to go out and reach these people for Jesus Christ. We who talk about having the truth of God and being the repository of divine revelation ought to be sharing it. They shouldn't be calling on us. We should be calling on them. You believe that? How many of you have called on my Jehovah's Witnesses? Raise your hands. Look around. How many of you, how many of you call upon Jehovah's Witnesses? Put up your hands. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. Most of them are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. The defense rests. They're doing our job better than we're doing. So let's not knock them for their zeal, their sincerity, their dedication, or their discipline. Instead, let's learn from them. Let's praise them where they're praiseworthy, love them always, and confront them with the gospel. Plant the seed in water. Scripture says, if we plant, if we water, God will give the increase. Whoever has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the church and obey Him. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. Our Father, in the quietness of this moment, we raise our hearts and our souls to Thee and worship Thee, King of kings and Lord of lords. And ask Thee to place this burden upon our souls together that we may stand before Thee. That men may take knowledge of us that we have been with Thee. Breathe upon us with thy Holy Spirit. There are only two kinds of people that entertain questions after a lecture, the quick and the dead. If you're not quick, you can be very dead. Tonight we'll try and answer as many questions as we can. We do have a time limit on it, so we can get you out of here at a reasonable time. 
and therefore we can expect you back again hopefully tomorrow night and the next two nights. I'll be talking on the New Age Movement tomorrow night, the most rapidly growing occultic group in the world. Time Magazine in the United States said that more than 60 million people were involved in this in America and alone. And that means that you are dealing with a cultic organization which is exporting itself to Canada and already has a headquarters in Edmonton, Alberta. So you are not dealing with a small organization, you're dealing with a very big movement, the New Age movement, which has also infiltrated many denominations. And it's therefore important for us to understand what they teach. Do not bring any young children tomorrow night with you, because I will be talking about one of the dangers of the New Age movement, which is demonic possession. We're going to talk about that and give some biblical illustrations on how we can deal with people who are in the New Age movement. So please pray about tomorrow night's meeting, and we will deal with the New Age movement at that time. And on Wednesday night, I'll talk on the baptism of boldness, God's secret power for us. How do we really confront the cults? How do we meet people in these areas and do it victoriously as Christians? God has a solution for that, and it's very clearly in His Word. I've used it for years, and I want to teach you that on Wednesday evening. Okay, if there are people who have questions, please come to the microphone on my left in the center and to the right, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. If you're upstairs, please come downstairs, because there are no mic jacks up there. Okay, sir, go ahead. Uh, first Peter three eighteen. Sorry, I'm going to have to uh, quiet a little one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first Peter three eighteen is often used by the Jehovah's Witness in response to uh, John chapter two, which you referred to. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous, the unrighteous, one. put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Yes. And they emphasize that made alive in the spirit that Christ was put to death in the flesh but was made alive in the spirit. Which is when you to come and come. Yes, uh, I'll answer that. They do quote 1 Peter 3.18. The only problem is they're very poor Greek students. And if they were good Greek scholars, they would know immediately that the passage in context talks about Jesus Christ being put to death in flesh and being made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We learn that in Romans chapter 8, uh, where it specifically says, If the Spirit of Him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He will in like manner cause your mortal bodies, flesh and bone, to come to life. So when you cross-reference Paul and Peter, you find something completely different than what the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching. Put to death in the flesh and made alive in the Spirit, or by the Spirit, means that Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was also raised from the dead by the power of His Father. First Thessalonians teaches this. And we also learn that He was raised from the dead by His own power. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit raised the body of Jesus Christ from the dead. Since Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in the Trinity, obviously 1 Peter 3 has been mishandled by them. The passage you want is Romans 8, 11, and it refers to the Holy Spirit raising Jesus from the dead. Yes? Hi. Um, last night you mentioned about how we can learn about our, uh, learn from Mormons about zeal, and having second kind of zeal that they have. And again tonight you mentioned that we can learn from the Jehovah Witnesses about that. And I'm just wondering, just thinking about uh, other religious organizations like Muslim Buddhism, and just seeing the zeal that they have, that they're willing to die for their own religion, and seeing that the cultists all have the same sort of thing. What is it that's instilled in them that creates that type of a zeal? And secondly, why don't we as Christians have that, and what can we do to create it in, in ourselves? I think we as Christians, when we permit the Holy Spirit to control our lives, and we are living in accord with the Word of God, we have power that dwarfs all the zeal that they have. The zeal that the cults have, and non-Christian religions have, is what we call in theology autosoteric, self-salvation. They are out there working as hard as they can so that they will be saved. Christians don't work for salvation. Salvation is the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2 says, Not by your works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. By grace we have been saved. The Christian has zeal because they have passed out of death into life and are living in the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The cultist is trying to merit salvation by working for it. And the scripture says, 
not by any works of righteousness which we have done. So that's why they appear to have this tremendous drive and zeal, because they're out there saving themselves. I wish Christians wouldn't be so complacent. I think that one of the marks of a true believer is that the Christian is out there doing the job. If you don't see people who profess Christianity doing the job, what are you supposed to think? That this is truly evangelical Christianity or truly historic Christianity? Historic Christianity changed the world. We've got to begin changing our world in the United States, in Canada, wherever we are. And our zeal is grounded in Scripture. The Bible says there is a zeal not grounded in knowledge. And it accused the Jews of Jesus' time of having that kind of a zeal. But the true zeal of the believer is because we have been born again, we are out there trying to bring people into a saving relationship with Christ. We're not out there trying to stay born again, and we're not out there trying to earn being born again. Completely different. Yes. We must have covered all the bases tonight because we have a few people coming. Yes. If you have any questions, please come. Feel free to come. I'll try and answer them as rapidly as possible. Sir. Dr. Martin, you mentioned uh, something about the ignorance of the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses respecting church history. Yes. And you referred to something called an ecumenical council and uh, a pronouncement that they made against somebody named Arius. Uh, what is an ecumenical council and of what relevance are their uh, historic pronouncements to the Christian church today? Ecumenical councils were called by the Christian church uh, across the centuries for the purpose of trying to deal with problems which arose in the church. The church already had its basic faith, but people were constantly springing up challenging the faith of Christianity. So it was necessary for councils to be brought together, presided over by bishops who were the ruling elders of their part of the uh, world at the time, and they came together and voted on this particular subject specifically so that they could affirm what the scripture said. That's why you have the Council of Chalcedon, you have the Council of Nicaea, etc. The idea of the council was Christians coming together to deal essentially with false doctrines and also to enunciate New Testament theology. What would their relevance be today? Could we use them authoritatively in some manner? We can learn a great deal from the church councils. However, Luther, Luther quite properly observed that popes and councils do err and uh, at Vatican II, uh, Pope Paul apologized to the Protestant observers there for any problems which the Catholic Church had caused, the Roman Catholic Church had caused, uh, at the time of the Reformation, because they said, he said, we, the Catholic Church, must bear part of the responsibility for what took place at that time. And he turned to the observers and said, we humbly apologize to you if we have offended you by any actions which were taken at that time. Obviously, councils, Pronouncements are valuable, but they are not scripture, and they are all to be tested by scripture. Did they have, uh, now, I can't go on giving an ecumenical lecture because that's not the purpose of question period. The purpose is to answer questions relevant to the subject tonight. I've answered that question as far as its relevancy is concerned. With respect to the scripture, uh, did the council... Uh, you're going right on. When I just told you I'm not going to go on anymore. Okay? Well, we test... I'm not going to go on anymore with the subject. That's the third time. I'm not going to go on. Thank you. Right here. I'd just like to say that uh, take a minute of your time. Could you speak a little question. louder? I'm sorry. I, I wasn't going to ask you a question. I'm just going to let people know that uh, I'm a former Jehovah's Witness in town here. And we've set up a phone number and a uh, box that people can write to and ask us questions as witnesses. <coughs> and if I can take a moment and just give people that number, uh, we can encourage others to see what kind of zeal we can give them and help them to help other witnesses. That's very gracious of you. I would suggest after the meeting that you come forward here and talk with John Tate and give him your number and address and that other people who are concerned might also get this information. Very valuable, and we're certainly glad that the Lord has delivered you from that. Yes. My other question. Yeah. That was the uh, husband of Fiona, the, the, the lady and the, and the man that came to know Christ. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. I thank God for that. I'm certainly glad the Lord has delivered you from that. Yes. My question basically pertains to the general aspect of the cults. And, uh, well, as you read the Bible, more talks on the Antichrist and Antichrist. And I was wondering what your basic opinion is. Uh, is it that we're going to have one Antichrist that's going to come over and we're going to have lots of trouble with that? Or is it just a general term for the seers? 
In 1 John, he says, there are many antichrists, plural. We know it's the last times. But he prefaces it by saying, the antichrist, singular, the antichrist, will come. And he will. He will sit in the temple of God. He will proclaim that he is God. He will command fire to come down from heaven. He will persecute the church. The church has always believed it's historical, the Christian church, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, that we would pass through the tribulation period and we would be persecuted by the Antichrist. Now, the view that you will not go through the tribulation is less than 150 years old. And if you want to believe it, fine. I hope with all my heart you're right. But if all the church fathers and the reformers and the theologians, Catholic and Protestant and Orthodox, are right, and the church certainly has taught this historically, we will face the Antichrist, and we ought to be informed about what he is going to do. So there are Antichrists, plural, but there will be one great Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's very clearly taught in the scriptures. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Where she had quit. Yes. How many years ago? About oh, I'd say probably about 17 years, 18 years. Well, I think I think it must have changed since I've only been Christian for three years. But uh, no mm -hmm. way could I go out with my former friends, which I had many at that time. They just shut the door. And in fact, they have to be in a store and come here. They out. weren't so tough in those days. No. Well, they are now. Even my husband would go days and go talk. Yes. So I just wondered, you know, because it'd be terrible for me. I would be able to walk and it wouldn't even let you in. I just wondered, you know. Well, what you can do is when people treat you that way, you can tell them, well, I want you to know that I love you for Jesus' sake. And I'm praying for you. I certainly hope that you will study God's Word and check it out for yourself. Well, I didn't catch one in the store about three weeks ago. I, Good. Yes, but she just kept walking. I got to say a few things. That's as far as you get. Go get him, Tiger. question here. How can you ask a Jehovah's Witness to read from his Bible? Isn't it their own translation? If so, then it must be wrong. The Jehovah's Witness translation is not a bona fide translation at all. If there is anybody in the Jehovah's Witness organization that's a Hebrew or Greek scholar, I found out who translated the Bible. Not one of them has a degree in Greek or Hebrew. And uh, the only one that knew anything about it at all was Freddie Frank, the president of the Watchtower now. And Freddie went for two years to the University of Cincinnati and never took any courses on the subject of classical or Koine Greek that we know about. So their translation is really an amalgamation of other translations. And where they couldn't get it to say what they wanted to, they just mistranslated it. The average Jehovah's Witness doesn't know that. They think the Watchtower has scholars. I have a standing offer to the Watchtower organization. Produce your scholars on national radio and television for an open discussion on the New World Translation anytime I made that offer in 1950, this is 1988. In 38 years, when they received that offer in a registered letter, twice, they have failed to respond. They will not meet and discuss their scholarship because their scholarship is so bad. Now why do I let them use their own Bible? Because nine times out of 10, they borrowed from another Bible. And so I can use that particular Bible so far as I know that the past translation is accurate, and most of the time, because they borrowed from somebody else, it is. The places where it's inaccurate is where they get to the deity of Christ and the Trinity and things like that, and they just mistranslate the text. So that's why I use their Bible uh, when I can't use the King James. And what you can say is, get them to use the King James Bible because they print the King James Bible and distribute it. So if they print and distribute it, then they ought to be able to use it. So I get them to use the King James Bible occasionally also. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, in the uh, second epistle of John, verse 10, it says, uh, If there come any unto you and bring out this, this doctrine, receive them not into your house, neither bid it uh, speak. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, this passage was used for a long time by Christians to keep anybody out of their house who was a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or a cultist. And they totally ignored the historical context, and they totally ignored the practice of the early church. In the historical context, John is writing as the ruling elder at Ephesus, the apostle of the church, and he is saying, there are false teachers going about, and they are entering into your homes. But you see, Christian churches met in people's homes, not in buildings like this. 
So he's warning them, if you're having a church service in your house and studying the word and praying, and somebody comes to disrupt it with false doctrine, don't let them in and don't wish them Godspeed. That's very clear. From a historical perspective, the church never kept people out of the house who were unbelievers. They invited them in to evangelize them. I mean, if you took the passage literally, you could never ask your uncle, your aunt, your sister, your brother, your cousins into your house unless they first brought the doctrine of Christ. And if they said, well, we don't believe that, you could never let them in. The church never taught that. Right. Anybody else? There was one other question which I was asked. A person wrote beautiful, clear handwriting, so small that my trifocals are having difficulty seeing it. Christians sometimes use Matthew 123 as evidence that Jesus is God. You can't use that passage that Jesus is God uh, because of the name Emmanuel. Because it is true that Hebrew names in the Old Testament often incorporated the name of God. I'll tell you the one you can use with them. Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will rest upon his shoulder. They all agree this is Jesus Christ, the Jehovah's Witnesses. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor El Gibor, the Mighty God, that is the name of Jehovah, Father of the Everlasting, Ruler of Peace. Of his kingdom there will be no end, and upon the throne of his father David he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. The zeal of Yahweh Yenokim will bring this to pass. So what you're dealing with is a clear-cut statement that says Messiah is divine. Can't possibly miss it. Isaiah 9, 6, not Matthew 1, 23. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question about uh, Christmas. I wonder if they don't believe in Christmas or birthdays. Every time you write it down, it's like that's idolatry. 
Same argument with Christmas trees, same argument with your birthday, same argument here. Why are you saying uh, Thursday, Ford's Day, the God of Thunder and Lightning? Why are you saying Monday, Wudan's Day, the All-Father God of the Norsemen? How come we do all that? Because it lost its significance as time developed. Originally it was pagan, nobody thinks of it that way now. So they're not consistent. They, they write down Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday all the time. They also tell you they won't salute the flag. They won't salute the Canadian flag. Most of the American flag, because that's the symbol of the power of your nation. And if they salute that, they are giving homage to something other than Jehovah God. I always have fun with them because I reach into my pocket when they say that, and I take out an American dollar bill, and I say to them, did you ever look at the dollar bill closely? Most of them haven't. And they say, look at the back of the American dollar. I said, on the right-hand side of it, there's an eagle, and there's a Jewish star over the top of the eagle, and underneath that is the American flag. Every time you take the American flag in your hand, you salute our currency system. I've never seen a Jehovah's Witness yet turn down a buck. <laughs> so you see, it's convenient for them to do these things, but they have to, it has no real meaning. Okay, sir. I also have a play Catholic background. I've been a believer now for 18 months, and I've been witness witnessing to an elder who has been in the Watchtower for 53 years. Yeah. And he's yelled at me, called me names, and threatened to phone the police while I was talking to him in his home. You're getting through. <laughs> That's what you're here. My question is, how long do we persist with him? And I think of the persistence that it took to lead ex Satan's Mike Warren to Christ. I think what you do with a person who resists the gospel is give them the truth of the gospel, use whatever opportunity you have to witness them that God opens up to you, pray for them. If they come to the place where they say, I'm not going to believe this, I don't accept this, I reject what you're saying, I reject you, you say to them, I'm going to go on praying for you and ask the Lord to open your eyes and show you these truths. I love you for Jesus' sake. But I certainly am not going to take time away from people who do want to hear to spend time arguing with you about it. I'm just going to give them the facts and make an occasional call and talk to them and pray to them. But even our Lord said, it is not a safe thing to cast pearls before the swine of unbelief. You can't get to the place where people simply will become so hostile that it does more harm than good to talk to them. I think you have to be guided by the Spirit when you back off.